All right, well, uh, welcome to our Bible study today. This is our electronic version of our Bible study. We are definitely in uncharted territory here, so uh, please bear with me. Be uh, Our Lord is gracious and merciful, so I ask the same of you. Uh, with that, let's begin. Now, we left off last Sunday with our study of Mark, Mark chapter 15, as you can see here. Uh, this is Good Friday. Jesus has been nailed to the cross. Um, we're getting towards the very end here. The people are passing by, uh, wagging their heads and, and, and deriding him. We also have the chief priests and the scribes, so the Sanhedrin, mocking him. And then even the criminals on the cross are mocking him. So it's definitely not good. Uh, let's move on to the next slide then. So the sixth hour had come. Uh, we know that that means noon, um, sixth hour by Hebrew rendering. Uh, because the first hour begins at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour had now come. Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. And then there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, you know, just as I'm thinking of this, uh, the sixth hour, noon, uh, the ninth hour, 3 p.m. I remember as a kid uh, where I grew up, the uh, the deli, I don't know if the other stores were, but I remember the deli in town was closed on Good Friday from noon to 3 p.m. And, you know, for schools, we were on Christmas, uh, Easter break. But the deli closed from noon to 3 p.m., so we were not able to go get our candy like we like. They always had now and laters and and Big League Jew and things like that. We weren't able to go hit up the deli from noon to 3 p.m. on Good Friday. Was, you know, just thinking back to the way things were, I guess, and kind of uh, in, in what we're facing right now, I wish we could kind of go back to the way things were. I wonder how different would things would be today. Anyway, I digress. Um, many people, so we have this whole darkness over the whole land, it says, right? Uh, as I say here, many people, and that includes some Christians with good intentions, they attempt to explain this as astronomical phenomena. Okay, and what I mean by that is, like we say here, um, the volcanic eruption. You know, uh, you watched the quote-unquote history channel with the the history of Bigfoot and the history of UFO abductions and things of that nature. So that should already tell you what I think of the history channel. But the History Channel, National Geographic, those types of things, they, uh, they try to say that, well, it was a nearby volcano like the island of Santorini. See, this is when Atlantis disappeared because the volcano erupted and all the ash spewed in the air caused a great blackout. Uh, another, and I was alive when Mount St. Helens erupted. I think that was, what, 1980 or 81? I mean, I don't remember it. I was very young, but um, Krakatoa, I guess, was the big volcano maybe 100 years ago, something like that. I don't remember, obviously, but uh, I remember it said, scientists said that when like the, uh, the Krakatoa erupted, it spewed so much ash in the air that it actually blocked out the sun and caused... Uh, uh, winter, like in the midst of Julys, there was snowfall and things of that nature. So uh, where I'm going with this, guys, is to say people read this portion of Scripture, darkness over the whole land, and they say, oh, well, see, that's a volcano. We've seen that in the past, so that must be what it is. Others will come along and say, oh, well, now it's uh, a full-blown solar eclipse. That's what happened. Uh, you know, and, and either way, whatever they're coming up with, volcanoes or eclipses or whatever, never mind the fact, this is just your dork side of me coming out, uh, you can't have a solar eclipse when, uh, when the moon's in that position. Uh, keep in mind, it's Passover time. Uh, so there's the solar eclipse at that time is impossible. Okay, You can't have a solar eclipse on the, the full moon. At any rate, whatever the case may be here, guys, it, what we're going at is that um, the superstitious evangelists, people say, oh, well, see, it's, it's a natural occurrence, and the superstitious evangelists are saying, ah, see, God is upset, you know, and, and really there is no God is what they're saying. Well, that's, 
uh, here I do put well-meaning Christians will add in. Well, you know, God does use science. So they try and defeat the atheists who say there is no God. It's just an eclipse or it's just a volcanic eruption. And Christians try and help it out. And they say, well, God's using science. He's using a volcano. He's using an eclipse. Here's my big thing, guys. Can't we just let it be a miracle? Can't the word just stand alone? Do we have to try and explain everything? Sometimes a miracle is just that. It's a miracle. You're not going to explain it, so stop trying to explain it. All right, enough with that. Now, what was the extent of this darkness? Well, what does the text say? The text says the whole land, right? We know from uh, Luke as well, it was over the whole earth, now, that should say, you know, again, a lot of the naysayers, even good Christians come along and say, well, it's local, it's regional. You know, that was just something, a big dust storm kicked up in Jerusalem. So that's what they were seeing. Um, you know, it's it's regional, something of that name, global. All right, well, now maybe that fell over the whole earth. Well, okay, perhaps. I think we're getting closer. If If you get people to at least admit that maybe the whole earth fell dark and not just uh, a regional thing like the the eastern hemisphere or the northern hemisphere or something like that uh, we're definitely getting closer uh, what about the concept of the universal darkness okay everything went dark do you think that that's possible well if we read what luke what uh, luke says luke 23:45 says this the sun's light failed Okay, so that doesn't mean that uh, the sun, you know, I, I picture back when I took my daughters uh, to Disney World back when they were kids. And my, my little Haley, who's now 23 years old, uh, she was shocked when we took off. We took off out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, a little airport there, and we had to punch up through some rainy clouds flying down to Florida. And you know, Fort Wayne weather, kind of typical, rainy, overcast, blah. And we punched up through the clouds, and it was bright and sunny and blue. It was beautiful. And my little Haley, I think she was at the time seven. That sounds about right, seven years old. And she was amazed. You know, she said, Daddy, it's, it's so sunny up here, so bright. And, and I think a lot of times people think like this, that uh, when the sun, well, when darkness came over the land, they picture it like, uh, you know, like a, a local or regional thing. The, the whole world is still shining. The sun's still shining, things like that. It's just it was obscured and dark, you know, a shadow or a pall cast over that area or maybe over the earth. But that's not what our Lord's Word tells us. It says the sun failed. So the very light of man, the, the light of the universe failed. Okay, so there is darkness. Everything to do with creation has gone dark. Now, this is important when you think of uh, what we hear towards the end of Revelation, right? There is no need for light in heaven because the sun, S-O-N, God is the light that lights heaven. There's no need to have uh, created light. The creator lights the world. So something to think about that when it goes dark, it's because all of creation, all of sinful creation has failed. So, you know, there, what does this darkness indicator profess? It indicates that um, this is what happens when God pulls away, okay? All of sin, we, we are seeing the wage of sin at work. We are seeing God's wrath against sin. The, the darkness is professing or confessing what it is to be forsaken by God. And it's sad. The man doesn't get it, the, you know, our culture, man, well, I'd say that, man doesn't get it, but the very created elements get it. They are, are confessing. Even when man's an idiot and, and thinks he's God, the rest of the universe is confessing and saying, this is what it means to be apart from God. All right, moving on. The sixth hour had come, okay? So noon, darkness over the whole land. Uh, Jesus cries out then at the ninth hour. So three hours of darkness, three hours of forsakenness. He cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, 
which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now we're told here he cries out with a loud voice. That's what this Greek term is, megalephone. You can hear the word mega, okay, mega, and then phone, like a phonograph. So it's a great voice he cries out with. Now, this is really cool when you think about it. Out of the darkness, okay, all of creation is failing in utter darkness. Out of the darkness, the voice of the word cries out. Now, we need to ask, a megalephone, uh, is that a cry of victory? He cries out with a great voice or a loud voice. Is that a cry of victory? Well, the answer obviously is no. Your Lord makes it clear. He is being forsaken. So he's not crying out in victory. Yay, I'm forsaken. That's not it. He's actually crying out utter defeat. Now, there is a good way of coming at this. You know, it, when your Lord cries out that he is forsaken, is that our victory? Well, yeah, I, your Lord is forsaken so that we are not forsaken, right? The, his forsakenness is our victory. But just down the brass tacks where we're at here, when he cries out with a megalephone that he's been forsaken, that is not a victory cry. But let's put a tack in that. We're going to come back and revisit this word here shortly. All right. In the book of Genesis, you know how that begins, right? <laughs> it begins in the beginning. Uh, and then also the Gospel of John is, is very Genesis-like. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, right? Nothing was created uh, except by the Word, a beautiful language, if you read John 1, 1 through 14. It's basically the New Testament Genesis. It's beautiful. But whether we're speaking in the Old Testament or in the Gospel, uh, in reference to creation out of nothing, in both cases you have the voice of God piercing the darkness, the word of the Lord piercing the darkness and giving life. Well, now think about it. Here on the cross, what do we have? We have the word of God in the flesh crying out, piercing the darkness, right? And he's proclaiming forsakenness. He's proclaiming eternal death. So kind of cool to think about. Um, th there's this great reversal going on, right? Uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, the voice cries out from darkness and gives life. Here, the voice cries out from darkness and proclaims death, forsakenness. You know, and that here, we could talk, um, let's define hell. For many people, to def you know, uh, the definition, I guess the common definition I hear is hell is the absence of God. Now, that's kind of true. But you know, if we say it's kind of true, now we're flirting with, um, that. that's the kind of stuff the devil uses, right? It's kind of true. I don't want kind of true. We want true. Either it's true or it's not. So to say hell is the absence of God is, is not true. Um, the way your Christian forefathers, so not just the Lutherans, but the way your Christian forefathers have always explained it is hell is the absence of God's love. You know, heaven is the absence of God's wrath. Hell is the absence of God's love. And then here in between, in this temporality that we live in, uh, between heaven and between hell, here we, we get a glimpse of God's wrath and we get a glimpse of God's love. You know, and I don't want to cheapen it that way. We know God's love in word and sacrament. We know God's love. But make no mistake, we will come to know it more fully when we get home to heaven, right? And as bad as things are, I mean, look, we're doing an electronic Bible study because we can't be in church, because of, of plague, you know, um, pestilence. Uh, are we seeing a symptom of God's wrath against sin? Yeah, I mean, I would say that. Uh, I would not be like the, the freaky televangelists who say, see, this is proof God is punishing us. No, that's not true. Coronavirus is not God punishing us. Uh, you know, uh, when sin was punished, it was punished on the cross. All right, We are seeing symptoms or, or, or signs of God's wrath against sin. God is not cool 
with uh, or or indifferent to man's sin or or man's definite rejection of God, um, we are seeing the effects of sin or the symptoms of sin in something like this. But guess what? You see the 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 symptoms of sin when you lay down to go to sleep, when you get a, a simple cold or the sniffles or, or uh, just an ache and pain. You know, those of you who are a little more seasoned, the aches and pains that you feel just to get vertical in the morning, those are symptoms of sin. That is not the way God intended it. So anyway, when we, you know, back to here, I know I'm already, we may not be meeting in person, but I still go on my tangents. It's, you know, this is just how we roll. So you're really not missing a thing, are you? Back to here. Define hell, all right? Hell is the absence of God's love. Do you think that that's what's going on here? The complete absence of God's love. I mean, that that is hell, right? I mean, that is hell on earth right there. No one, no one, uh, can ever say that they have been completely forsaken by God, not on this side of eternity. Only our Lord Christ can say that. Only. Even somebody like Osama bin Laden or, or Adolf Hitler still had God's mercy and grace to a certain extent. They still had blue sky over their head. They still had air in their lungs. They still had opportunity to repent and hold fast to him until that last breath left their lungs. When they entered into the other side of eternity, that's when it's too late, right? You have forsaken God, so guess what? Now God is going to forsake you. That's how it works, kind of careful what you wish for. You want to act like a devil? God is a just God. He will treat you like a devil. But here, your Lord Christ is the only one who's ever experienced true hell on this side of eternity. Something to think about that our forefathers have uh, addressed in the past. You know, who's in charge of hell? If hell is the absence of God's love, not the absence of God, period, but the absence of God's love, well, who's in charge of hell? The answer is God. Uh, the devil's not in charge of hell. He's not in charge of anything. He wants you to think he's in charge, like he's... Um, you know, he's on par with God, uh, but that's not the case. The devil is nothing. He's a dethroned loser, okay, kicked out of heaven. God created hell for the demons, and that's the whole tragedy, really, of justification. Uh, God created hell for fallen angels, for rebellious angels. He didn't create hell for man, but God's a just God. As I said, you want to act like a devil, you want to rebel against God and act like a devil, well, care for what you wish for. You're going to get it. All right, back to our study here. How does the John, Genesis and John, you know, in the beginning, those, those creation texts, how does that apply to us perfectly? Okay, the voice calls out of the darkness and gives life, right? I mean, that's us. Uh, we were born in darkness, conceived in sin and darkness, and the voice of God cries out to us and gives us life. It's beautiful. I mean, it's sad when you think about it how so many of the Reformed denominations like to take credit for their coming to faith. You know, and I always liken it to uh, the corpse deciding to make itself alive and give itself CPR. And that's just asinine, isn't it? The corpse cannot decide to become alive and then give itself CPR. No, we are conceived into sin. We are conceived and born corpses of sin. And it is by God's grace, through the working of his Holy Spirit, that we, we get divine CPR, right? The voice cries out, and by God's grace, it breathes life into us. Now, uh, typologically, typology is just a fancy way of saying uh, the smaller points to the greater, okay? Um, and that's all we're looking at, the smaller points to the greater. So a good example of typology would be uh, the bronze uh, serpent, you know, that was lifted up in the wilderness and gave life to those who were stricken and bitten by the, the wicked serpents and, and basically uh, sentenced to die, and your Lord says, make this bronze serpent, lift it up on this cross, and anyone who looks upon this will live. 
Now, your Lord Christ himself says, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. And we know what that means, because all who look upon Christ and hold fast to that promise attached to that cross will live. So there's just an example of typology, the smaller pointing to the greater. Typology here, um, the voice cries out of the darkness and gives life. The voice cries out of the darkness in this instance and proclaims death, but it's proclaiming our life, isn't it? Um, the voice cries out and gives life. The voice of Christ cries out in forsakenness, giving us life. It's beautiful stuff. It's God working in very mysterious ways, isn't it? Here is our salvation. It's Christ being forsaken. Now, one, one note to make here before we go to the next slide. God never stops being Jesus God. Okay, And the way you need to look at it, this goes back to uh, the temptations in the wilderness. Your Lord Christ never forsook God. He never turned from God. He never um, bowed down to anything else or, or even like his own belly, you know, his own grumbling tummy. He doesn't have another God. It's always been his Father is his God. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus did that perfectly. You know, and he had to because we fail miserably. Now, if you look here, even as he is being utterly, utterly forsaken, it is still my God. Uh, that's really profound when you think about it. God has forsaken his son, but the son has not forsaken his God and Father. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. All right. Now, some of the bystanders, they hear Jesus saying this, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or as we hear in the, the uh, Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, keep an eye right here on this, Eloi, Eloi. What do the bystanders say? Okay, that would be the wicked fools, the, the Sanhedrin, the, all the naysayers who are mocking Jesus. They hear him. Eloi, Eloi, and what do they say? They say, ah, behold, he's calling Elijah. Now, I need you to think about that. The bystanders we've already addressed, those are the wicked naysayers, who are not the bystanders. Okay, just to set it clear, the bystanders are not the Roman soldiers. How can we say that? What Roman soldier, what pagan Roman soldier is going to know Elijah and know that, oh, he's calling on Elijah. Um, and they, they would know the Jewish religion that says, uh, well, not just Jewish, okay, the, the Old Testament prophecy. So not just Jewish, the Israelite Old Testament prophecy that says Elijah must precede the Messiah. And then your Lord Christ, if you remember, says, and I tell you that John the Baptist is Elijah, the new Elijah. Okay, so uh, the bystanders are not the Roman soldiers because they don't know all that goes into Elijah and Messianic prophecy. It's that simple. Who are the bystanders? It's all the wicked ones, the, the wicked naysayers, whether we're talking uh, the false witnesses, you know, uh, or the Sanhedrin, whoever it is, all those who are mocking Jesus and, and, and who are Jewish. They're the bystanders who say, ah, behold, he's calling Elijah. Now, this is where we run into problems, okay? And it says, someone ran, filled a sponge with sour, sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him. And they say, wait, let's see if Elijah will come take him down. So the assumption, that should already cue you in, assumption, not good. The assumption is, is that these bystanders are acting mercifully. They hear Jesus cry out and they say, oh, you know, the light bulb goes on. And they say, well, oh, he's calling Elijah. Quick, give him something to drink and let's wait and see if Elijah comes out. Maybe we, you know, maybe we messed up and let's try and make things right before Elijah gets here. You know, so it would be acting mercifully, acting with regret. Sorry, guys, none of the above. What they are doing when they say he's calling Elijah, 
give him something to drink. And, and then right here, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come take him down. That's all mockery. Every bit of it. They cannot help themselves in spite of three hours of darkness. Not to mention all the other um, uh, miracles that are about to transcend. Three hours of darkness and everything else. They cannot help themselves. They have to keep on mocking. So when your Lord says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, they say, Eloi, Eloi, ah, hey, look, they're just making fun of the word Elijah. They say, look, he's he's so strung out and stupid and far gone, he must be calling on Elijah by saying, Eloi, Eloi. That's all they're doing. They're making fun of him. And, uh, you know, now we would insert, and I, and I will explain more of this after we hit this, John 19, 28, 29. This is where that break would come, right up here. They mock him for calling Elijah, okay? Then we would put a break. This is right here where John 19, 28 to 29 would come in. And if you remember, that's, uh, that verse simply says, I thirst. Jesus says, I thirst, and it says someone ran, and they filled a cup, uh, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop reed, and gave it to him. Right here. They mock him, they mock him, and then it says, Jesus says, I thirst. Who goes and fetches the drink? Well, the answer would be the Roman soldier, one of the Roman soldiers standing at the foot of the cross. Okay, The wicked bystanders mock him. Jesus says, I thirst. A Roman soldier, probably like, you know, the equivalence of like a young private, the corporal who's in charge nods at the private and says, go get him something to drink. Now, why does the bystander fetch a drink? Like we said, Jesus says he's thirsty. What is this drink not? And I know that's kind of a crude way of putting it, but if you remember at the very beginning of the crucifixion, the Roman soldiers were trying to give him uh, wine mixed with myrrh, okay? Gall is how it's also called. Now, that, that myrrh uh, was basically, um, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, a drug, okay? They, they wanted to get him all strung out, basically. It, it wasn't to kill the pain. It wasn't a, a, a kind of merciful, you know, we're going to give you an a, um anesthesia before we administer this so that you can die with dignity and and no that's the garbage we do today um, that was at the beginning when they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh and he said no he doesn't want to get all strung out and tripped out and as i said in the past um, if jesus did take the wine mixed with myrrh would we have the seven words that he speaks from the cross would jesus was going to experience all the agony of of God's wrath. He, he wasn't going to be tripped out and escape any of this. Okay, So your Lord declines all of that. So now, fast forward six hours later, Jesus says, I thirst, and they give him sponge, a sponge filled with sour wine. This drink, this sour wine, is not wine mixed with myrrh. Do not confuse the two. Okay, uh, Jesus did not want the psychedelic effect of, of uh, wine mixed with myrrh. He would not take it. This is sour wine. This is wine that has basically become vinegar. It's, it's, uh, it's garbage. You know, it's garbage wine. It, it's uh, the $2 wine. It's nasty. That's what's going on here. So they give him the, the, the dregs, the leftover, you know. Um, I shouldn't even say the dregs. They just give him the nasty stuff. He's thirsty. Here, just shove this in his mouth. Kind of uh, quenches his dry palate a little bit. The whole idea was to prolong the crucifixion. So they weren't giving him a painkiller or anything like that. The whole idea of crucifixion was to prolong the agony. You were supposed to be on that cross two to four days. You know, it was sending a message. So uh, when they give him this, it's just basically to, to um, quench his parched thirst. Now, why does Jesus ask for a drink? This is going to become important uh, probably in the next slide here, and I will try to be brief with this, but 
Jesus asks for a drink, not because he's thirsty, but because he needs to moisten his, his lips and his tongue so he can speak. And I'll already give you a hint what's coming up. The next words he speak proclaim victory. So why does Jesus need a drink? Not because he's thirsty so much in the sense, oh, you know, I'm dying. He needs he needs to stuff. He says, I thirst. He needs a drink because he's parched. He needs to be able to speak. That's what's going on. So let's move on to the next slide. And we're going to finish this slide and call it a day. Jesus utters a loud cry and breathes his last. He needs the drink so that he can proclaim with a loud cry and breathe his last. He can proclaim with a megalophone. Now, remember? We said Jesus proclaims with a megalophone, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not a cry of victory. What about this? Do you remember what that Latin? Mark doesn't record it for us, but the other gospels do. The, the most beautiful word, and it is a single word uh, in the Greek, the most beautiful word in all of scripture. He says, tetelestai. He utters, he gets the drink, I thirst you know, uh, part, uh, quenches his thirst, moistens his lips and his tongue, and it enables him to cry out with a loud cry, a cry of victory to Telestai. It is finished. And that's it. I mean, talk about the cry of victory. It is victory. It is finished. It is not a cry of, uh, oh, it's finished and I failed. You know, woe is me. It is a cry of victory. It's finished. Mission complete. And with that, he breathes out his last. Now, uh, we can end here for today. We'll hit on these two words. He breathes out his last. We know from Matthew that it says Jesus breathed out his noima. Okay? Um, not his suke. People like to think that. He breathed out his last breath. So he, the difference here, guy, is, is, is uh, noima. Okay? Like, like the word pneumatic, air. This is the word for spirit. This is why I capitalized it here. This is the word that is used for the Holy Spirit. Versus suke, which we would just translate as soul. Okay, so Jesus breathed out his last. You know, he breathed out his soul. He gave up his ghost is how it's often understood. But that's wrong. Matthew tells us that Jesus yielded up or breathed out his noima, his spirit. So he's not just breathing out his last, you know, oh, expiring in death. No, he's breathing out his Holy Spirit. The Spirit that was put upon him, remember, in baptism. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove and descends upon him. And this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now three years later, mission complete. Your Lord, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they return home to heaven, right? The mission's complete. It's done. Now, when does the Holy Spirit get breathed out again? Well, think about it, guys. Easter Sunday. What does your Lord do? John 20. He, he shows up to a, a room full of uh, scared disciples they're hiding behind locked doors. The last they've seen is their Lord Christ nailed to a cross and dead. He shows up behind locked doors. The first thing he does, he speaks the word peace. Okay, then he shows them his wounds, and then he speaks that word peace again. So let there be no doubt, peace is found in the wounds of the resurrected Christ. And then we're told what? It says Jesus breathes on his disciples. He breathes out his spirit, right? Receive the Holy Spirit. The sins that you forgive are forgiven in heaven. The sins that you retain are retained in heaven. The office of the keys. Jesus is, is basically ordaining the apostles. Receive the Holy Spirit. Just a little side note. When our Greek Orthodox brothers, this is one of the schisms that, that has split the church since the 700s. Why, Roman, why, why the Western Church and the Eastern Orthodox don't get along? One of their big beefs is that uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't proceed from the Son, but only from the Father. We call it the filioque controversy. It's Latin for from the Son. 
They, the Orthodox say, no, 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 the Son doesn't, uh, the Spirit doesn't proceed from the Son. He only proceeds from the Father, only comes from the Father. Well, that's a pretty poor reading of John chapter 20, don't you think? Receive the Holy Spirit, says Jesus, as he breathes out upon his disciples. Anyway, Jesus utters a loud cry, gives up his spirit at the resurrection. There he is, right? The, the spirit has returned. And what does your Lord do with the spirit? The resurrected Christ, he breathes out his spirit. He gives life. Life, not just this kind of life, not just having a pulse, he gives eternal life. He breathes out. Receive the Holy Spirit. All right, a couple of quick questions. Where did Jesus' soul go upon death when he breathes out his last? Where does Jesus' soul immediately go? Well, he tells, uh, he answers it himself, right? He tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So where does Jesus' soul go upon death, upon breathing out his last? He goes to heaven. He goes home. Where does his soul not go? This is so important. His soul does not go to hell. Not at this point. Okay? Uh, and the reason I say this is because Jesus does not go to hell to suffer sin. One of my best friends growing up, uh, he, he had made this statement that, well, you know, when Jesus, because we confess in the creed, he descended into hell. And the third day he rose again. And he said, well, yeah, Jesus went to hell to pay for our sins. Not true. When was it is finished spoken? It was spoken on the cross. All your sin was paid for on the cross. Your Lord Christ did not go to hell to pay for sin. He went to hell to proclaim victory. And he did this only after He's resurrected. How can you proclaim victory over sin, death, and the grave? And keep in mind, you need a resurrected body to do that, then, don't you? How can you proclaim victory to the souls in prison, to all those in hell who've rejected you, to the devils? How can you proclaim victory over sin, death, and the grave if the body's still in the grave? So your Lord, his soul goes to heaven on Good Friday, and sometime on Good Sunday, before you know, but before the the tomb is even, uh, uh, before the stone is rolled away and man goes in, when your Lord's uh, spirit, when his soul returns and 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 vivifies or revivifies, resurrects the flesh, your Lord descends into hell to basically take a victory lap. Okay, this is so super important. So super important. Uh, I will skip ahead to a slide just to show you this, and then we'll come back next week and hit on this. The humiliation and exaltation of Christ. This is so important with the two natures of Jesus. We see uh, our Lord Christ, right? I mean, he is fully God. The fullness of God dwells within him bodily, it says in Colossians. This almighty God you see how he's humiliated, right? How he goes uh, low for us. He suffers all this for us in our place. So Almighty God gives up all the glories of heaven to be conceived, to be conceived into a virgin's womb. You know, and think about it. You're giving up all the majesty and glory of heaven to take on the residence of a little virgin's womb, to be born a natural childbirth, to suffer to be crucified, the lowest of the low, to die. And then he's buried, right? The consequence for the fall into sin, from dust you were made to dust you shall return. Now that's not Jesus. Jesus was not, um, he's not created like man is created. He's conceived and begotten, different. But Jesus suffers what Adam deserves. He is buried. Notice how we've always looked at it. The exaltation, descending into hell, is actually the first step in exaltation. He doesn't descend as a form of punishment. He descends to proclaim victory. He can only do that in the resurrected body. So then you see the exaltation. He was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, or, or he descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father, and from thence he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. So here's judgment day. Here's where he's at now. Here's judgment day. The best is still yet to come, but make no mistakes. He's buried, and then he descends into hell to proclaim victory. Our, our, um, oh, uh, our inflection when we confess the Apostles' Creed always... Uh, we, we betray a, a misunderstanding, you know, because he was crucified and he died and he was buried and then he descended into hell. But on the third day, he rose again, right? And no, this is victory. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again. So this is from our reckoning. We get to see the stone didn't need to be rolled away so he could get out. The stone needed to be rolled away so we could get in. So here is, from God's perspective, he descended into hell, body and soul complete to proclaim victory. And then from our perspective, we get to go into the tomb and see, hey, he rose again. Okay, The humiliation and exaltation of Jesus. That's what it's all about, guys. That is our victory. And that is our victory. It is finished, right? I thirst all so he can cry out and proclaim our victory. And that's where we'll end for today, guys. Um, we'll pick up next week, maybe in person. You know, God willing, all this goes to rest and we can meet again in person. If not, we will pick up next week in video form and we will pick up with the, uh, the miracles when Jesus breathes out his last, surrenders the spirit, and basically, the world lets us know what's going on here. We'll pick up with that next week. Till then, God bless and uh, keep you safe. Amen. <laughs>